I'm Jerry Savloff, the president of SFI, and it's a really great pleasure to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming, despite the much needed rain. Uh, it's great to have all of you here. You're missing the president tonight, but I think you're in for a much better uh, treat than, uh, than that. So thank you for being here uh, for our annual uh, Ulam Memorial Lectures. The, the series was inaugurated in 1994, so this is our 20th annual uh, Ulam Memorial, Memorial Lecture, and uh, we're really pleased at that. <laughs> These lectures were named in honor of the great mathematician, the late Stanislaw Ulam, who worked on, uh, famously on the Manhattan Project and then uh, subsequently lived here in Santa Fe. And as part of his legacy, his scientific library now forms the core and base of the library at the Santa Fe Institute. Over the years, uh, the lectures have been given by a host of scientific luminaries with ties to the Institute. The first Ulam lecture uh, was given by John Holland uh, on hidden order, how adaptation builds complexity. And in subsequent years, scientists, and this was great fun for me going back, uh, Ginger Richardson prepared this list, includes Alan Perlson, uh, sitting here in the first row, Simon Levin, Melanie Mitchell, Brian Arthur, Murray Gelman, Chuck Stevens, Jeffrey West, Don Farmer, Dick Lewontin, Henry Wright, Marcus Feldman, Nina Federoff, Sam Bowles. Then in a special session honoring uh, Murray Gelman's 80th birthday, we had Sir Chris Llewellyn Smith, Dan Schrag, and Mark Pagel. Dan Schrag also then uh, uh, gave on his own another year. Mark Newman, David Krakauer, and last year, uh, Lord Robert May of, of Oxford. Uh, so our speaker tonight joins, uh, I think, a, a very impressive uh, list indeed. As always, we gratefully acknowledge the support of uh, Los Alamos National Bank, which supports our whole community public lecture uh, program, for which we're grateful. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Dunn. Jennifer is the SFI Chair of Faculty, Vice President for Science, and she'll introduce our 2013 Ulam Memorial Lecturer, Stephanie Forrest. Jen? It's my great honor to introduce Stephanie Forrest for her first of three Ulam Lectures. Stephanie's primary affiliation is as a distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of New Mexico, a uh, department she joined in 1990. However, it was also in 1990 that she started her long-standing association with the Santa Fe Institute. And Stephanie has been at the core of SFI's intellectual life and governance for much of the institution's history. At SFI, she has variously served as external professor, resident professor, interim vice president of academic affairs, member of the science steering committee, member of the science board. And in July of this year, she finished up a three-year term as co-chair of the science board. She has been a valued advisor and mentor to many, including me, as I take on the responsibilities of Chair of Faculty and Vice President for Science. It's always a pleasure uh, when uh, Stephanie pops into my office, a welcome opportunity to talk about various aspects of SFI life with someone who has seen and done it all. Uh, Stephanie is now taking her advisory capabilities to DC for the next year as a Jefferson Sc uh, Science Fellow with the State Department. Uh, beyond all the titles, Stephanie has played a special intellectual role at SFI, as she was one of the first people to apply complexity science to problems related to human-built engineered systems. Having received a master's and PhD from the University of Michigan in the mid-1980s in one of the first computer science departments, she quickly embraced yet another emerging field, that of complex adaptive systems. The application of complexity science perspectives to engineered systems which she helped to pioneer, is only now coming to fruition at SFI and elsewhere. For example, at SFI, there are a variety of research projects and meetings related to topics such as the power grid, the structure and dynamics of cities and slums, and analyses of social networks such as Wikipedia. Stephanie's research has taken her deep into the world of biology, where she and her colleagues have moved far beyond superficial analogy between computer science and biology, to develop deep interchanges between the two disciplines. She has published extensively on topics such as immunology, epidemiology, evolution, cancer dynamics, and scaling theory, resulting in advances in both computer science and biological understanding. And indeed, she has held a secondary appointment in the Department of Biology at UNM since 2001. Over the course of her three talks, Stephanie will touch on a variety of aspects of the important interplay between complex system science 
engineered software and hardware systems in biology. As Stephanie wrote in a recent article for the New Mexican, the level of complexity and the challenges our computers and networks face have much in common with those faced by organisms and even ecosystems. She examines the fertile intersection of biology and computer science and searches for the common secret sauce that makes both computers and organisms tick. Tonight, her topic is software engineering evolving computer programs. Tomorrow night, she'll discuss the complex science of cyber defenses, computer immunology. And Thursday night, we'll focus on modeling computer networks from chips to the internet. Before I hand it over to Stephanie, I wanted to mention something else about her background. Uh, before moving into the world of computer science, complex systems, and biology, Stephanie began with a foundation in liberal arts with an undergraduate degree in the Great Books curriculum of our very own St. John's College. As someone uh, with an undergraduate degree in philosophy who similarly moved into science later, I think this is a highly underutilized academic pathway, uh, which can provide a more nuanced and global understanding of science's intellectual and societal roles. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Forrest. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, this is just such a tremendous honor. And um, I don't know, SFI and this community means so much to me that I've been unusually stressed out about putting together these lectures on all my own research that I should know so well by heart. But um, I just want to thank all of you for coming tonight. And um, I'm very happy to have this opportunity just to share, um, share what I've been up to in the lab all those times when I um, have been hidden away. So um, I've spent most of my academic year here in New Mexico, and I'm deeply grateful to the four institutions that have shaped the ideas that I will present tonight. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes um, to acknowledge these very special places. And the first one, as Jen mentioned, is St. John's College, which I have to say started me down the path to interdisciplinary ruin and introduced me, but it also introduced me to mathematical logic, which in kind of a circuitous route led me into computer science. And um, this is not exactly chronological. There have been some um, spots in my life when I was not in New Mexico, but my next uh, tour of duty was at the Center for Nonlinear Studies, where I was a postdoc for two years, and I met Alan Perlson, and um, that started me down the path to working on immunology and we'll be hearing more about that tomorrow. And um, then I somehow ended up at the University of New Mexico, which turned out to be the absolute best career move I could have made. And um, I've just had fabulous colleagues down there and wonderful students. And I just have to say, I think um, my university is underappreciated in the state of New Mexico. We really just have a very talented faculty there. And finally, of course, um, SFI, which I've um, sort of used every trick in the book to have some association with SFI over the years, as Jen mentioned. And um, it's really been my intellectual home. And um, everything I will talk to you about in these three lectures would never have happened if it wasn't for SFI. Um, but of course, it's the people who make these institutions so wonderful. And um, I don't have time to acknowledge all of you tonight. Um, but I just wanted to mention in particular my students. I've had really unusually good students over the years, and they've provided um, most of my good ideas, and they've done all of the hard work on those ideas. And um, they keep me on my toes, and they, in particular, help me uh, put these lectures together. So um, they really uh, deserve a big, a big thank you. OK, so now, uh, now we'll start the talk. <laughs> Computers are human-designed systems that have grown in complexity to the point that we can no longer comprehend or manage them using the traditional methods of engineering. And I believe that, and my work is dedicated to the idea, that biology has already discovered solutions to many of these problems. And so in these lectures, we will consider several examples um, attempting to illustrate how SFI-style science can contribute new approaches to engineering. And I just love this quote from Einstein um, that I, I think my pro approach is sort of in that same spirit, that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Um, and that's, of course, been a little bit of a tension in my career as a computer scientist. 
So here are some of the aspects of biology that have fascinated me over the years, uh, both because they're interesting and because they illustrate properties that we would like computers to have. Uh, biology achieves these properties by using very different design strategies than we started out with in computer science. And so um, the first of these properties, properties is resilience. And I should say, this is like my current list. I always have a list of these design principles, and it, it changes a little over the years. But basically, um, biological systems are very resilient, and they use many different strategies to achieve that resilience. Um, the ones that I've been the most interested in are uh, homeostasis, the idea of continually, a system continually monitoring itself and making small adjustments to keep it within normal operating tolerances. The idea of disposable components. This is something that we have really not done a lot of in computing, but biology, all living systems are built from cells, and those cells uh, turn over uh, more rapidly in some places than others, but they all turn over, and that uh, provides an important, uh, an important sense of resilience where the uh, no one cell is crucial to the functioning of the whole. And finally, uh, diversity. I'll talk about that uh, more in the next lecture. But biological systems are diverse, and that um, provides a lot of protection, sort of species-level protection, that, um, that we would like to have in computing. Uh, biological systems also adapt very naturally and gracefully to new circumstances. They can repair themselves when they're injured. They, um, and this, this idea about this next item, the optimized networks, is um, something that other SFI scientists, Jeff West and Jim Brown, have worked on a lot. But it seems that biological systems um, have these transport networks, like vascular systems that transport um, resources to all the components of the system, the individual cells. And it seems that these networks are um, highly optimized, if not optimal. That is, they, they are very efficient, um, efficiently designed. And so that's something that we would um, like to have in computers. I'll come back to that more in the third lecture. And finally, uh, the thing that we'll focus on tonight is that all of this happens through this sort of distributed, bottom-up, um, evolutionary design process. So our lectures are going to build off the idea that biological systems um, are really at heart information processing systems. And um, that's not the only way to think about a biological system. A lot of other models of biological systems look at them as mechanical systems. But I um, base my work on, on the idea that they are also processing information. I will... Um, see where we are. Okay, I will um, focus my, my lectures around three problems that, uh, that affect all of us. Excuse me. Um, so the first one is software. And as I will explain in a couple minutes, uh, we all use software every day. And um, that software has a lot of um, flaws and errors in it, known as uh, bugs or um, glitches is kind of the euphemism. And um, they have become a significant economic cost and a significant risk in some cases. So that will be lecture one. Lecture two um, is going to be focused on the problem of security and safety on, um, in the online world. And that's important because so much of our lives have moved online from uh, social networking and dating to embedded medical devices. And so it's really, I think, a problem for all of us. It's not just an esoteric um, academic topic to figure out how to secure our, our networks and our computers. And finally, these applications are all mediated by power-hungry, amazingly power-hungry computers, and um, increasingly dictated by high-level governmental policies and corporate marketing strategies. And so lecture three, we're going to explore how we can start to get a handle on these runaway technologies uh, through the use of modeling tools. And um, in honor of Stan Ulam, for whom these lectures are, are named, I want to say that, that many of these modeling tools are derived, in some sense, from, from advances that, that Ulam made. So each of these lectures, I'm going to start with a short tutorial, and then I'm going to introduce some current problems in the field and just give you some scary statistics about how bad things are. And then I'm going to get back to the biology and try to show you how we can use biology and complexity science to address them. 
Okay, so now is the tutorial. It will, oh, no, not, the tutorial's not quite yet. <laughs> I first want to say that this work I do is I'm not the only person who does it. And uh, there's a field that people refer to as biologically inspired computing. And I never have liked that term very much. I really like to think of it as the biological perspective on computing. But fields like artificial intelligence, neural networks, genetic algorithms, which we will talk about, ant colony optimization, artificial immune systems, which we will talk about, and even quorum sensing are all examples of this kind of family of related um, algorithms that are inspired by some aspect of biological systems. And I should say that um, the inspiration is sometimes more direct than others. And um, I'm kind of agnostic about how, how directly we should take these analogies. Um, so it range, ranges all the way from very specific mechanisms to very abstract ideas like the idea of diversity. Okay, so now we get to lecture one, uh, which is gonna be on evolution, using evolution for software repair. And so the tutorial is going to be what is software and talking a little bit about the problem of bugs and why it's so important. Then I will talk briefly about how to um, implement Darwinian evolution in a computer and then how we can use that to automatically repair bugs. And then depending on how much time I have left at the end, I want to get back to kind of the bigger, um, the bigger picture about software ecosystems. Okay, so I guess um, all of you know you use software every day, every time you make a phone call. Um, your kids, if not you, use social networking every day. Uh, when you fly on an airplane, uh, there's a lot of software involved with that, and increasingly um, the airplanes don't actually need the people to fly them. Um, every time you do a financial transaction, and um, more and more we're starting to see robots in our environments, and, and I think that's a trend that will increase over the next decade. And so all of these examples use software, whatever that is. And so um, what is software? What does it actually look like? This is, um, this is a, an example of a very famous program written in the programming language C. So people write, uh, write programs in many different uh, dialects or languages. Um, you may have heard of Java or um, the people from Los Alamos love Fortran. Python is a popular one right now. Um, anyway, this program is very famous because it's the first program that people typically write when, um, when they're learning, learning a new computer language. And so it's very simple. Um, the first line, uh, let's see, maybe that's not working. Well, that wasn't working. I've got two. Robustness is a good principle of biology. Okay. So the, uh, <laughs> um, so the first line is a comment, and it says what the program is. The uh, next line is going to load in a lot of other programs, and I'm not going to tell you about, that handle I.O. Okay, they read, they read data into the computer. They get, they get data from the central processing uh, main memory of the computer out to a computer screen or out on a network. And... Um, then we get to the main part of the program. This main routine is called main. And all this program does is print out the phrase, hello world. So that's why the program's called hello world. And truly, it's a very famous program, even though it's very short. OK, so how does this program actually communicate with the computer? We all sort of know, one way or another, that the computer deals in ones and zeros, known as bits. And um, this high-level language that I showed you, the C program, doesn't actually have any bits. doesn't look like it has bits. So um, there's this great invention. I think it's one of the great inventions in the 20th century called a compiler. And uh, the compiler is itself a computer program, but we won't worry about that. It, um, and it takes this program and translates it into another language known as assembly code. And um, this also doesn't have bits, it, ones and zeros um, explicitly, but it's much closer to the kinds of instructions that, um, that computers can understand and much uh, further away from what people can easily understand. Okay, so then um, we've gone, we take one step, we get to the assembly code, and then there's one more step which is referred to as linking. That's when all these other things like uh, standard libraries get loaded in. 
um, and loading, which actually translates the program into the uh, lowest level um, ones and zeros and copies it into the CPU of your memory, of, of your computer, or into the main memory, excuse me. And um, once it's been loaded, that is copied into the um, main memory, then if you run the program, it, um, it will do whatever it's supposed to do. In this case, it prints out on the screen, hello world. So this basic process of specifying instructions at a high level, translating it, the, the instructions into bits, loading the bits onto the computer, and then running them to see what happens is uh, what we refer to as computer programming. So for those of you who have kids who do computer programming, that's basically what they do. And um, unfortunately, just like um, life with a dog or a child, what the computer hears from um, after your high-level language is translated into bits is not always what the programmers intended. And, um, and so there are sometimes these communication glitches or bugs. And um, as we see here, they can be extremely frustrating, and, um, but they are also ridiculously plentiful. And, and so that brings us to the first of these problems that we're going to orient our lectures around which is the problem of software bugs. And it turns out that um, most of the cost of so software is spent on maintenance. So that's this little thing right here. Um, and maintenance, uh, there's a lot of things that go into maintenance, but a huge piece of it is fixing bugs. And so we have the situation where um, we have um, too many bugs. This is just one example. I love this quote. So anyone who uses a Firefox browser that software, the software that implements that, um, that browser, is um, produced by this Mozilla project. And one of their developers um, said one time, um, every day, almost 300 new bugs appear. And um, that's way too many for them to handle. So there's too many bugs. Um, they take too long to fix. So even security critical bugs, which as we've learned in the past few months reading the newspaper, are very important. Um, even security critical bugs take on average 28 days to be uh, repaired and to have a, um, a patch um, distributed. And the cost is enormous. These are old figures, but I don't know that the number, the fraction has changed that much. Um, the annual cost of software errors, just the errors, has been estimated to be as high as 0.6% of the GDP. And I'll actually have a worse figure for that that I give, um, give tomorrow. So this is a really, this is a serious problem. And um, in fact, it's gotten so bad that companies have begun paying strangers to fix their bugs. So these are actually three examples. I don't know, I, I maybe should have separated them, but this is from Google, this is from Mozilla, and this is a smaller company called Tarsnap. It's a uh, cloud services company. And um, all of these companies and many others have started um, these bug bounty programs where essentially they invite, um, invite strangers to find bugs and propose fixes for the bugs. And uh, this it started a couple of years ago and is still going strong. Uh, the, these values were, I, I think, are a couple of years old. I don't exactly know what the price per patch right now is. Um, but it's, it's, really, it's really, as a person who's been in the computer world for a long time, it's really a remarkable development that these big, uh, highly respected companies are, first of all, admitting that they have this many bugs, and secondly, actually just opening it up to the world to fix them for them. OK, so um, how do we actually repair bugs now? And um, the first thing is we try to ignore them. Many, um, many of the software products you use um, ship, are shipped with known, known bugs. And actually, the state of the technology is that we have much more ability to find bugs automatically than we do to fix them. And that was part of what motivated this project that we'll eventually get to. So uh, the first thing we do is try to ignore them and you have our users be the beta testers and fix the, fix the bugs that the, uh, that the users really notice. The second thing we do is we pay expensive programmers to fix them manually. And, um, and, and people have noticed that that's expensive. So um, we have developed tools to help the programmers. Things like debuggers and profilers and type checkers, 
All of those are tools that programmers can use to make themselves a little more efficient at manually fixing the bug. And then finally, there's a, um, a field of research um, called formal verification or formal methods that tries to develop mathematical models, a mathematical statement of what the program's um, supposed to do. And so the idea is if you can write down this mathematical set of mathematical expressions, then, um, then you could prove that a program is correct, which would be a really nice thing. And this technology's made a lot of progress in the past 10 years, but it still can't scale up to web, web browsers and, and really large scale production software systems. So um, now we're gonna get back to biology. And um, our idea was to address this automatic repair. People, there, was, there is a lot of technology out there for automatically finding bugs, but no one had really um, jumped into the water and said, let's, let's just try to fix them. And, um, or they had tried to, to, tried to do that, but in very, very constrained, um, uh, you know, constrained situations where they had some of these mathematical models. And so our goal was really to, um, to just take software, off the shelf legacy software, and have a generic method that could fix bugs in that software, and to do it without requiring this mathematical model. And um, this project, I've been working on this for about five years, and I guess one of the things, you know, I'm a little nervous, I just want everyone to know, I've had a lot of fun doing these projects I'm talking to you about in these lectures, and this project in particular has been a lot of fun, um, in part because of my collaborator, Wesley Weimer at the University of Virginia. He is um, an expert in software engineering, and his student, Claire Laguess, who wrote a lot of the original programs, and then two of my students, um, Vu Wen and Eric Schulte. And by now, we have quite a few other students and postdocs involved, but they were kind of the original four. So um, I said that we were gonna try to use evolution to fix these bugs, and now what I need to do is tell you how, how we could actually do evolution in a computer. This idea was um, invented by John Holland, uh, believe it or not, about, in about 1960. And John is, uh, he was my thesis advisor, uh, but um, aside from that great, um, great thing he can claim, he was also a founder of the Santa Fe Institute and um, has been a big impact on the um, intellectual development of the Institute. And um, John's observation was that there are three basic ideas in Darwinian, um, the Darwinian account of evolution. First of all, individuals have random variations and um, some of those variations make them more fit. And they especially make them more fit in the sense that they can have more offspring and they can have offspring sooner. Okay, and the third thing is that those variations, so it might be I can run fat, the animal can run faster and catch more food, uh, might be more attractive to a mate. There's a whole lot of things that might go into this differential reproduction. But uh, the key thing is that the, um, these variations are passed on to the, to the next generation of offspring. So John took these basic three ideas and thought about how to put them into a computer. And the story goes like this. Um, we are gonna have a population of individuals and the individuals are gonna have variations. So um, instead of being like animals in an ecosystem or cells or something, these, um, these little organisms are going to be bit strings just sequences of zeros and ones. And um, so I've got three examples right here. Here's one, here's two, here's three. And when we actually do these as genetic algorithms, we um, typically have much longer strings, like up to thousands of bits, uh, sometimes more. And we typically have much larger population sizes. But that won't really fit on the slide. So we just have a little population here of three. And um, we generate those randomly just using a random number generator. So that's how we get our um, random variations. And then we have a function called a fitness function that can assess the um, goodness, the, how, how good each of, these, each of these bit strings are. So I always think of that fitness function, it's kind of like a judge at a dog show. You know, you have all your different dogs um, coming into the ring and the judge is looking at them and going, this one's 0.5 and this one's 0.8 and sort of ranking them. Um, 
So we do that in mathematics. We don't actually do it in the dog show ring. But um, you can imagine a, f a function, for example, that just counted up how many ones there were and used that as the, as the fitness measure. Anyway, uh, whatever the fitness measure is, um, and there's lots of them, we'll talk about one uh, particular one in a second, um, we use that fitness to decide which of these individuals make it to the next individual, no, excuse me, the next generation. So the um, more fit ones get lots of copies made, the less fit ones get deleted from the population. And just like in biology, they don't get copied exactly, but they get copied with uh, mutations. So like a one might be changed to a zero or vice versa. And they even sometimes have crossover where two individuals get mixed up um, and exchange information so that we end up with two offspring that are uh, recombinations of the original. So once we go through that process, we then have um, the next generation and we just can reiterate the process, um, apply the fitness function to those individuals and um, keep going around that loop. And the idea is that with just a very few trips around the loop, um, we can get high fitness individuals according to whatever metric, uh, fitness metric we choose. Okay, so um, that's all I have to say about Darwin and that's um, all I really have to say about genetic algorithms. We're now gonna talk about how to use this to repair software bugs. So instead of those little bit strings I told you about, we're going to um, start with a C program. So I'm, go I, I'm going to be, oh, by the way, the name of our tool is GenProg, and um, it's kind of like genetic, you know, program repair, something like that. Um, so um, I'm like, I'm GenProg, and you're gonna give me um, one of those little C programs, like that Hello World program, except it's gonna be a program that doesn't behave properly. And the way that you're gonna know that it doesn't behave properly is because you have a set of test cases. And in software engineering, this is referred to as the regression test suite. Um, but you have a, a bunch of input-output pairs that you can use, and this is what programmers do all the time, um, to figure out if their program's actually um, doing the right thing. And for big programs, you might, instead of having four test cases, you might have thousands or tens of thousands, or sometimes probably even hundreds of thousands of test cases. But in our case, we have four test cases, and this little C program passes the first three of them, but it, um, it gives the wrong answer or it um, chokes. We'll just assume it gives the wrong answer on number four. So you come to me, I'm the repair tool. You come to me with your program in the source code and with this set of test cases, and you tell me the one that it doesn't pass. And what I do is take that program and make 40 copies of it. This is our standard thing. We've, of course, tried all sorts of other things. But uh, we make 40 copies, each of which has a single mutation, random mutation. And I have to tell you what those look like in a couple slides. But um, they are all, all the 40 programs are going to be sort of like the original program, but they're all going to have little variations. And then um, after I've done that, I take one program at a time, and I run it on all of the test cases. That's the fitness evaluation. And the ones that do poorly get thrown out. The ones that do well, that score, have a high fitness score, get recirculated into the evolutionary process. And so when they get put back in the population, they have more mutations. Sometimes they have crossovers. And so we just kind of go around this loop a few times. And amazingly, with high probability, um, the, the system often produces a program as output that can pass all of the test cases. And so I should just tell you, that is my definition of repairing a bug, that the program can pass all the test cases. And you can question me about that at the end of the hour, but I think that's a, a pretty good definition. Okay, so um, I, I just need to tell you a couple of little details. Uh, just getting back to that uh, picture that we had at the beginning about the compiler, so I actually skipped a step. This here is the original C program. And on its way to getting translated, compiled into assembly code, it actually goes through an intermediate step. And the intermediate step takes the sequential uh, line of code program, the sequ sequential list of statements, programming statements, and turns them into a tree, a hierarchical representation of the program. And that's known 
as an abstract syntax tree, which you don't really have to remember. Um, it's just that we've done most, most of our um, experiments we've done on this representation. We've also done some at the assembly code level and the object code level, but I won't be showing you those results uh, tonight. Okay, so uh, I kind of skipped the question. I told you about the fitness. I told you about the representation, but now I have to tell you about the um, mutation and crossover operators. And so um, imagine that this is one of these abstract syntax trees. So each of these little dots is a, 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 a statement like print or if then else or while. Um, those are examples of, of statements in this language. And uh, we have three operations, three mutation operations. Um, the first one is copy. So we just um, take this statement here marked in yellow and make a copy of it and insert it at some other random place in the program. Total, this is all randomized. Um, the next one is delete, where we um, take, again, a randomly selected statement, and we just delete it from the program. And the third one is swap, where we just take two statements, randomly chosen, and exchange them. So those are our three operations. And um, I have to say, it's really surprising that they work so well. I'm hoping that most of you in the audience are skeptical about this. And um, these, um, these operations are notable for two reasons. First of all, we don't actually try to synthesize new code. Like you think of programmers as, you know, typing in new statements all the time. But actually these statements don't, these um, operation, operators don't do that. They just move things around in the program or delete them. Deletion is surprisingly effective, by the way. Um, <laughs> which we'll get back to that later. Okay, so, um, and then the other thing that's important for any com um, software people, computer programmers in the audience, is these mutations we do at the level of the statement. And that's, I just, that, that's a very coarse level, and it's surprising um, that, I mean, you can do a lot of damage to a program just by moving statements around randomly. And so it's um, kind of surprising that that works. Okay, so um, I don't expect you to read this, but this is a little bit bigger program than the one I showed you, um, but it's written in the same language, C. So there's just like, this is the next step. Hello world was programming assignment number one, and this is programming assignment number two. And so our operators, uh, this is the delete. We just delete a line out of the program. We might um, swap two lines out of the program or we might copy one line to another in the program. And um, we also do crossover. I don't have a picture for it, but it's sort of the obvious thing where we swap two parts of the program. Okay, so um, that is our mechanism, and it's really pretty simple. So how well does it work? Well, I don't know how many of you remember the Zune player. Um, this was Microsoft's answer to the iPod, and it was, um, marketed in 2008. They sold several million of these little devices. It's a, it's a music player, basically. And um, on New Year's Eve of that year, these um, Zune players started freezing up. And um, this was a big issue. The, the help desk, of course, got lots of phone calls. And it turned out that the reason it was freezing up was because of a software bug. And a software bug was in this uh, section of code, which is 18 lines long, not that much longer than um, that Hello World program I showed you. And, uh, but it's a little bit more complex of a piece of software because it has a loop. So this um, while loop, uh, it, it executes this set of statements over and over and over again until this condition um, is no longer true. And so that's an internal variable to the program and when that variable gets bigger than 366, then the uh, program is supposed to fall out of the loop and print out the current year. <clears throat> so what this program is supposed to do is take as input the um, integer number of days that it had been since 1980. That was the internal representation of date, but it was supposed to print out on the display um, the current year, like 2008. And um, this was the code that was supposed to make that translation. And guess what? 2008 was a leap year, and this program, although it had some code in there to handle leap year, didn't actually work correctly, and it, this loop just kept 
going around and around. That's known as an infinite loop. And um, that was experienced by the uh, users as freezing up. OK, so we decided we got hold of this code. It was posted on a website. And um, so we decided this would be a good test for our system. And we took, so we took as our negative test case the uh, date, sort of in the number of, uh, the number of days since 1980. We made up one other date to be, the ne uh, to be a negative test case. Um, and then we defined five positive test cases, which was a small number. And so then we made our 40 copies. We did a few mutations, just like those ones I told you about. And um, after a couple of generations, we ended up with a version of the program that could pass one of the negative test cases and one of the positive test cases, but it had forgotten how to pass the other four positive test cases and it still had one negative test case to go. So this is kind of typical how these evolutionary runs seem to go. And so uh, we ran it for another couple of generations and we ended up with this program which had um, deleted this line right here. This little sign is a comment sign. So it had deleted that and it had actually inserted in a separate operation uh, because we don't have move. It had, separate in, uh, had inserted this statement right down here. And it turned out that passed all the test cases. This was a small program. We could understand it. We convinced ourselves that it's actually a correct repair. And the amazing thing is, I don't know if you can see this down on the bottom, but it did that in 42 seconds. And I claim that there's not very many programmers, if any, that could fix that code in 42 seconds. And for sure, it wouldn't have been me who could do it in 42 seconds. OK, so um, one point I want to make about this is that the algorithm, this genprog, did this without knowing anything about dates or um, Zune players or it had no particular knowledge. It was just randomly moving this code around, trial and error, until it happened to pass the test cases. OK, so uh, we were pretty proud of that. We actually had one other little program, uh, Greatest Common Divisor, that we got to work. And um, so we were thinking, and I've had this experience many, not many times, but a few good times in my life, in my research life. We have this phrase in my research group, nothing says it won't work. None of, we have no evidence, no contrary evidence, so maybe we'll just take the next step. And that's kind of where we were with this project. And so uh, the obvious next question was, well, can we scale this up to larger programs and more complex bugs? I'm just uh, those citations there are the papers we've published on all of these topics. Um, what, how does the, the time, how does that 42 seconds grow as the size of the program gets bigger? Can we do it in other languages? Um, in particular, we've done it in assembly code and object code. Um, how good are the repairs? So we make these random repairs, but you know, what if they just introduce new errors? And um, are there things that we can't fix? And I'll just say, yes, there's a few things we can't fix. Um, why does it work? That was the question that I became interested in. And um, of course, the theoretical types want me to prove to them that the approach works. And I absolutely cannot do that, at least not yet. OK, so um, we have spent most of the, I should just go back. I should say that's five years of my life, right there on that slide, <laughs> just in case all of you wonder what I've been doing. Um, so. In the end, we've done a lot of experiments, but this, was, this is our experiment that we refer to as the many bugs experiment. And so we, um, actually that student Claire did this. She um, went to the open source community and found um, programs, um, eight large programs. Many of them you've used. Um, most of you, when you've gone to websites, have used PHP. Uh, those of you who program have probably used Python. Anyway, these are big programs that are in, uh, being used all the time. And um, she went through the records, sort of these source code repositories, and found, uh, distributed across those eight programs, 105 bugs that we could reproduce. That, I should tell you, is non-trivial. And um, bugs that were serious enough that a human programmer had decided to fix them. Those were, we had a couple of other criteria. Those were our main criteria. But we went through systematically and did this. And then we um, took each of these programs, packaged them up. They all came with test cases. That was another uh, requirement. So LOC is the lines of code. And so these all together 
totaled over 5 million lines of code and totaled about 10,000 of these test cases. And so we um, packaged each of these programs up with our little Genprog repair tool. And then we sent it off to the Amazon cloud computing service and paid real money to see how well Genprog could do. And, and I should say that we were optimistically thinking if it could repair 20% of those bugs in a completely blind systematic study, we thought we would be doing really well and we could write a paper. And of course, writing the next paper is always the goal in academia. And uh, <laughs> so we did it and lo and behold, it repaired on the first, it repaired 55 out of 105, that's 52%. And each of those um, successful bug repairs, even counting for the bugs it couldn't fix, factoring in that cost, um, totaled $7.32. Yes, we thought that was really good. We wrote a paper about it. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, of course, there's that 48% that it didn't fix. And so that is the kind of thing we obsess about. We did a few tune-ups to our algorithm, some fairly straightforward tune-ups. Um, and we managed to knock off five more bugs that got us to 57%. And then we just decided to spend more money, make bigger populations, run them for more generations. And on this data set, we actually got up to fixing 69% of the bugs. Um, I think 50% is a more, you know, I feel pretty confident telling people, yeah, this thing fixes about 50% of the bugs it fixes. But on this particular data set, we got almost to 70%. Okay, so uh, that was great. Um, I didn't really tell you what those bugs were, but I will just assert that they and some of the, their friends that were not included in that particular experiment cover many of the common kinds of uh, programming errors. Infinite loops, like what we saw for the Zoom bug. Uh, segmentation faults, that's when the program just crashes. And um, buffer overflows, we're gonna talk about that, and a whole series of other security flaws. And we'll talk about some of those um, next time. But anyway, it has fixed a wide variety of different programming errors, including um, just the good old fashioned logic error where it gives you the wrong answer. Okay, so um, how can this be? <laughs> how can such a simple method do so well? And um, that actually, I'm the most interested in that question and really trying to chase it down. And then of course the dual is what does it not do well? So um, one of the reasons it does so well is something that I guess a lot of programmers know, but I had not really appreciated, which is that most bugs are small. And so to convince you of this, I have a good old fashioned Santa Fe Institute style power law to show you. Um, and I'll explain what it is, but the, the X axis is the number of lines that had to be modified to repair a bug and the y-axis is how many, um, how many programs had that many lines or fewer. And so uh, where did we get those bugs from? Well, my collaborator, Wes, took the software package Eclipse, which is used widely by programmers. It's kind of, it's called a, um, a development tool. It's one of those development tools. And he went through the whole, um, source, the whole repository of all the changes and found 20,000 um, patches where the comment claimed this patch fixes this bug. So that was our definition of a bug. And he took all those patches and he just looked at them to see how many lines they changed in the, in the program. And it turns out that 10% of the patches were two lines or less. 20% of the patches were five lines or less. And those are pretty much easily within scope of this Genprog tool. And 50% of the patches were 25 lines or less. And so um, this plot right here is just that data. And um, the big takeaway message is that most of the bugs have really very few changes that you have to make to fix them. So if you're in the business of doing a systematic study, and just randomly picking bugs to fix, guess what? A lot of them are gonna be really small. So that I think is one reason that um, this method works. And um, another reason that it works 
is that, if I do say so myself, we're pretty clever. And especially Wes is pretty clever, my collaborator, because he knows all these tricks from software engineering. And so um, some of the cleverness is that we started with a working program. So unlike the standard genetic algorithm, we didn't start from a completely random set of bits. We um, started with a program that was almost working. It just has this one little flaw. And so that makes the program a lot easier. The second thing we did, I kind of skipped over this. We, didn't, uh, we don't just make random changes any place in the program, but our mutation operators and our crossover operators are applied only to the statements that are executed during the failing test case. So we're focusing our operations on the part of the program that is broken. And then there's a couple of other tricks that I won't talk about. Um, so that, that's sort of an explanation, but it's still, I think for most people, and certainly for me, very improbable that uh, this completely randomized blind method can um, actually fix these bugs. And it's not unlike the monkey sitting at the typewriter we, you know, us sitting there waiting for the monkey to produce King Lear or something. It just, um, that was my little St. John's plug. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, there's just something that doesn't really add up. And so um, that has troubled me a lot. But fortunately, I go to the Santa Fe Institute from time to time. I go to the Santa Fe Institute a lot. And one of the things I've learned at the Santa Fe Institute is about the, uh, this thing that's called the neutral theory of evolution. And a lot of people at SFI have been interested in this um, in the context of biological evolution. So the idea, the observation is that many biological mutations don't actually change the fitness of the organism. And so this is, and, and there's, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that this plays an important role in evolution and sort of enables biological evolution. And there's, as I, this is my reading of the literature, as I understand it, there's two reasons. One is just this kind of buffering idea that um, if every time you make a mutation, you, you kill off the organism, then mutation's not gonna be a very good search strategy. But if, you know, a reasonable amount of the time, you, if you can do some exploration without killing the system, then, um, then you have a better chance of, of finding something good. So that's the buffering idea. The genetic potential idea is a little bit more sophisticated. And so for that, I'm going to go to this picture that I took from a, a paper written by some SFI people. And the idea is that this blob here um, is a collection of all the genotypes in a system. It could be biological. They were writing about biology. All the biological genotypes that have a particular phenotype. That is, they have identical fitness. And the argument is that um, if you have this so-called neutral landscape, this sort of landscape of all these genotypes that have the same fitness, that there will be no pressure on the population. And so over time through drift, it's gonna, oops, uh, there we go, spread out around uh, this area. And it might eventually end up with one individual here that is a single mutation away from a higher fitness, um, a higher fitness individual with phenotype B. And so, um, that's my understanding of the theory. There's, it's a lot richer than the way I've explained it. I know I've simplified a lot, but we decided, we took that basic idea and wondered if that might be going on with our software programs. So we defined this idea of mutational robustness, which is the likelihood that one of those mutations, the copy, the delete, and the swap, um, what's the probability if I apply one of those uh, mutations randomly that the program will still have the same fitness. And remember, for me, fitness just means it can pass the same set of test cases. So we define this idea of mutational robustness, and then we ran some experiments. And much to my surprise, and actually the first set of experiments was run by um, an REU. We, the, SFI has this nice summer program for undergraduates who come from all over the country and um, I managed to snag one of those REUs one summer for this kind of wild, crazy idea. That, um, and so he did the first set of experiments. Since then, we've done a lot more. And I can tell you very consistently in all kinds of programs, from very small programs to large production things with zillions of test cases, um, 
about 30% of the time when we do those, muta do those mutations, it doesn't change the behavior of the program um, on the test cases. And um, I actually, well, aside from the fact that I think this somehow has to be the key to getting software evolution to go, um, it's just a remarkable fact about software. And in fact, it's so remarkable that um, a lot of the reviewers of our papers have uh, not believed it. <laughs> so um, I, it's just a killer. I mean, I've had a lot of good fortune in my career. I've gotten some papers published on the first try that um, turned out to be important. So I can't, I can't complain. But really, this is such a great observation. And uh, the reviewers have really been hard on it. But we did eventually get it published. OK, so um, what, how could that be? Like, I just want to give you, I just want to show you how it could be that you could make a random mutation to a program and it might not change its behavior. So here's a little example. This is um, a program called QuickSort. It's a very famous um, algorithm in computer science. And um, the central part of the program, basically, it takes a list. It picks a spot in the middle of the list. It's going to take in a set of unsorted numbers. And it wants to produce, uh, write out a set, um, the same set of numbers, but in sorted order, either ascending or descending. That's the, what the program is supposed to do. And the way it does it is by taking, uh, making a, uh, a cut into the, into the array of numbers and then sorting the left half um, recursively, you know, do, doing another cut, doing another cut, and then sorting the right half. But it doesn't actually matter whether you do the left half first or the right half first. So this is one, one neutral mutation our algorithm found. Um, it um, in, just could re switch doing the left first from the, the right first. It could just switch it and do the right first and then the left. There's a lot of other things like that. Um, we, I don't know how much time I want to take on this. Um, so we took one of these sort of, the sorting programs to me are really interesting because they're very minimal. They're very small programs. And so it's even more amazing that you could make these random mutations and not break the program. It's, it's much less amazing to me in the big programs. Anyway, so we took this um, program that's just like a few lines longer than that Hello World. It's called Bubble Sort. It's not a very good sorting algorithm, but it's really easy to write and it's really short. And so we took that program, bu Bubble Sort, and um, got some neutral mutations. And we took 35 of those neutral mutations and sat down and looked at what they were really doing. And this is just the kinds of things they did. Some of times it just makes little changes in the output. And so if you were really fussy about your output, you might say that's non-neutral. Sometimes it makes little changes into the internal variables that don't appear to the output. So they're invisible, and, uh, but they can still do the sorting job. Uh, sometimes it adds in extra computations it doesn't really need, um, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, that just gives you an idea of what these neutral mutations might look like. OK, so um, in case you can't tell, I'm pretty excited about this. And um, why do I think it's such a big deal? Because mostly we have this idea that programs are fragile. They're like this watch, old-fashioned watch over here, that you know, we have this idea that if you touch it, touch one little piece of the watch, it um, it won't work anymore. It'll fall apart. And, and unless you're a watchmaker, you'll never be able to get that part back in. Um, so that's why I think this is such an interesting result. And um, it also, along the way, I would say we have some evidence, but I haven't definitively proved that this is why our algorithm works as well as it does. And then finally, I think it supports this, um, what I like to call the strong biology hypothesis of computing. So. I never liked this bio-inspired term. And I actually think software has acquired these biological properties, like mutational robustness, through inadvertent evolution. That is, the actions of many, many programmers um, distributed all over the world over many, um, what is by now many years. OK, so I'm going to talk about that last idea for just a few minutes before I stop. Um, so just to set the stage. Until now, we've been talking about what I would call um, microevolution. That is fixing single bugs in individual programs or packages. And um, what happens if we step back and um, kind of look at, at 
macroevolution. That is, what would happen if we did our, our little algorithm over and over and over again, say 100 times? Or what would, what, what would large-scale software systems look like? Okay, so this is what I think large-scale software systems look like. I didn't draw this picture, but I think it sort of uh, represents well the state of the world. And um, our, tr our current software infrastructure now is, um, you know, in the true sense of the world, word, a complex network with self-interested players, lots of interactions, and lots of diversity. And we don't really have good ways to um, think about it or manage it. I mean, it's a mess out there. And um, so on Thursday, I'm going to talk a little bit about some things we're trying to do to understand it. But for the moment, I just want to talk about this system as an, as an evolving system. And so um, one way we might do that is to take the tack that Brian Arthur took in his 2009 book, The Nature of Technology. And basically, what he argued in that book, I thought was pretty interesting. He said, um, all of technological prog progress, it's, a, it, it's just like Darwinian evolution, but the primary driver is the, the crossover operator. It's a recombination of existing technologies. And um, he argues that, you know, that's, that accounts for all of technological process, uh, progress. And so I say, hmm, software resembles other forms of technological, you know, software is a kind of technology. And um, maybe it's just evolving, you know, an evolutionary system as well. And actually, when the announcement for this talk went out, I don't know if John's in the audience, but we immediately got someone back challenging one of the abstracts. And I don't know if you're in the audience or not, but they were challenging this idea that um, software is the result of, of evolution. And so I think that's a good challenge. And um, it's sort of incumbent on us to figure out how, how to prove it. And so to be able to prove that means we have to be able, we have to have a measure. How do we actually measure evolutionary progress? And I'm just going to hint at some of these answers. We're now getting to the hand wavy part of the talk and we're almost done. Um, so one answer is people believe that systems that are more evolved have more hierarchy in them. So food webs are an example of that, economic production networks, and guess what? The Unix operating system. And so this is a study that um, some people at MIT did. They measured, I think I'm not going to take time to go through this, but they measured these um, software call networks. So they went through the Unix operating system and took all the little components, the little functions, and made a graph. Just by looking at the, at the code, they made a graph of which functions um, called which other functions. And um, then they took that graph and they measured this thing that they call flow hierarchy, which is the percentage of links that don't occur in a loop. You know, you don't have a, a, a function calling a function, you know, A calls B calls C and then C calls A again. That would be a loop. And so they wanted to know how many of the links were actually not in any of those cycles. And they took that as their measure of how hierarchically structured the code base was. And I just want to point out that um, this is an idea that, that one of the um, great, uh, great grandfathers of our field, um, grandfather of our field who's great, <laughs> uh, Herb Simon pointed out. Okay, so um, what they, oh yeah, let me show you. So what they did is they took the Unix operating system, they got the code, uh, they got the code as it was in 1991, and um, every year they got a snapshot of what the programs look, looked like. They did the same analysis, and then they plotted their little metric. Um, they were trying to prove their metric was better than someone else's metric, so these are the other metrics. But their metric shows that the um, hierarchy actually increases over time. So that's one idea for how we might measure, you know, the evolution of these larger scale software systems. Another idea is to look at diversity. Diversity is um, another property that is closely connected with evolution and ecology. And uh, there's a group in France that's very interested in diversity. And they're studying how, um, this is, this is going to be a little technical, how object or in object-oriented programming, like um, Java, how uh, classes, which are sort of uh, groupings, groupings of the program, like functions, sort of, how classes are used. Um, so they, they take these classes that are defined in the Java language or b common libraries, 
and then they study their, how they're used in lots and lots and lots of other programs. And um, uh, what they find is kind of surprising. What they find is that their um, use is very diverse. These, uh, these classes are called in all kinds of different ways. The functions that are associated with the class are called methods. And um, the principle, the software engineering principle is, um, I forget the name of it, but it basically says, um, you know, a good class, a good class is one that is always used in the same way. And the only thing that really varies is the uh, data type that's associated with the class. And what they've demonstrated is that's not true, even for really basic classes like strings. And I apologize for the non-programmers in the audience, but I just wanted to throw that in. Okay, so although this um, work on hierarchy and diversity is in its early stages, I believe that we will see um, in the next couple of years, few years, maybe a decade, we're gonna see much more serious attempts to understand this complex system of interacting programs from an evolutionary and ecological perspective. And, um, and I actually think SFI should have a program on software complexity. So that's my pitch for the next direction that SFI should go. Okay, so um, just to wrap up, what have I told you? I've told you about this generic approach called GenProg to repairing software bugs. Uh, it doesn't use a formal specification um, and it doesn't need to know ahead of time what the bug is it's trying to fix or anything about it, um, and, except it has to have that test case. But I also want to point out, like obviously I'm pretty proud about this work um, and excited about it, but it's actually just a down payment on the real goal of you know, true software evolution and true automated programming. So we still have a long ways to go, um, which if you're in the research business, that's a good thing. You don't want to run out of problems. And um, then the second thing I talked about a little more briefly is this idea of software evolution. And I actually think it's all around us. Um, and I think one evidence of it is this mutational pro uh, robustness property that I told you about. Okay, so um, what's next? Um, I apologize, I, it's such a cute picture. I know it's, I know it's a little blurry, but um, so what's next is that once we have this complex soup of software and self-interested actors and all of this, the next thing that's bound to show up are malicious agents. And um, so for every time we find a lion that learns how to eat a zebra, sooner or later there's gonna be a zebra that learns how to get away on a motorcycle. And um, that's gonna be the topic of lecture two. So thank you very much. Okay, I can't, Jenna, I can't see, so you're going to have to call on people. Ah. If, that, if that percentage is large, then you're getting your advantage out of being able to just discard them and focus on the ones that are fit. Right, okay, so the question, yeah, yeah. So the question is, um, I didn't tell you how many of those mutations it takes to actually find a repair. And um, indeed, we um, have more bad mutations than we have good mutations. And I just, I, I just would have to think about it before I gave you an exact number. Um, but it's way less than what you would expect just from first principles. And, um, but yes, I, I admit that most of the mutations are deleterious, just like in nature. But I guess the remarkable thing is that uh, the percentage is high enough that we can afford to do it this way.
Ah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, I didn't, I didn't say anything about like what probability we use to pick the mutations we have, and I certainly didn't say anything about any other mutations that we might have tried that I didn't expose to the light of day or the light of night. Um, so in fact, um, one of the algorithmic tune-ups we did was to um, go back on the many bugs data set was go back and analyze which mutations were helping us, and the probabilities were wildly different from what we expected, but we then, then took those probabilities and um, applied them, and that was how we got, that was one of the ways we got the extra five bugs. Um, I feel like um, the answers we got might be pretty specific to that data set. Um, so we've done a little bit of playing with it, uh, but we don't have a theoretical way to do that, and maybe you can help me with that. Um, yeah, I definitely think there's an analogy, and I'll be talking about that tomorrow night. <laughs> I guess that's the basic, the, the basic answer. Um, I guess the, the other thing that I would say is that um, once you enter the world of engineering, I mean, one difference, I mean, biology has to be efficient in some sense to survive, but um, you know, they don't have these engineers breathing down their necks saying how much did it cost and can you, how fast did it take? And so it's really, um, you know, incumbent on us to be able to show that our method can uh, find these repairs faster and less expensively than people or other, other competing methods. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the question is, um, yeah. Well, firstly, first of all, let me just uh, um, I'll change it into an esta a statement that I should have said. We are only as good as our test cases, and if we have really bad test cases, then indeed we might evolve some unusual things. Um, one of the studies that I just skipped over, my, uh, my collaborator, Wes, um, has the approvals to do human studies. And so he's done some human studies, and, and we've done um, these, our little GenProg repairs look pretty good to people. That's the bottom line. But since you asked for an anecdote, I'll tell you an anecdote. Um, we've also done a lot of experiment, some experimentation with the assembly level programs. And when my student, Eric, was doing those experiments, he... Um, uh, well, programmers are lazy, and you know you sort of want to be doing. You want to be doing these um, these experiments in the equivalent of a petri dish, so you need to kind of protect your computer from some of these mutations. And he maybe didn't do as much of that as he might have. Anyway, so he um, well, he had a number of, number of these programs that that would mutate and crash his program and things like that. So he slowly built up more and more of what's called a sandbox. But then he, um, one, of the, one of the programs evolved, um, figured out a way to delete all the test cases. So it got perfect, perfect fitness. So that's my best anecdote that I can think of off the top of my head. Yep. Oh dear. <laughs> Ah, okay, so just in case you didn't hear that, um, yeah, one of, one of the things that I'm assuming is that you give me the bug. You, you give me the, the program that has the bug. 
And um, I guess I would say the mutational robustness studies we did were on software uh, without bugs. So that's one example. Overall, we have not tackled that problem of bug finding, mostly because there are other ways of doing it that, are, that can currently find more bugs than we have time to fix. So that, that's, um, you could imagine using something like this to fix bugs, I mean, to find bugs. Yeah. Right. So I've done relative. Um, um, people people have been interested in that, and that's certainly an area that we've thought about going. So the idea is, and I think I had a little item there on my slides. Um, the idea is to use this uh, genetic algorithm technique to evolve test cases that can break the program. And um, we have not done as much of that as, I mean, I always put it into my grant proposals. I always put it into my future work. Somehow we never get around to it. And um, since Chris raised his hand, I just want to point out that Chris, uh, this is Chris Moore. He's a resident faculty and he was one of my colleagues down at, at uh, UNM for many years. And he's the one who actually sent around that um, Zoom bug code. I don't know if you remember that, but you um, sent that around the mailing list. And so it's all your fault that I'm still talking about the Zoom bug. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>